like a lion's mane. <laughs> You're not funny. Get out. For the jelly baby. It's going to be great. <laughs> Hey now, I'm looking forward to today's guest. This man has been part of the pop culture firmament literally for as long as I can remember. Two-time Lifetime Achievement winner at the Radio Academy. One-time King of the Jungle. Who could it be? Woof, woof. Thank you, Arnold. It's Tony Blackburn. Well... If I'm not mistaken, it's Tony Blackburn. You're not mistaken, Rob. It is. It's a real pleasure to talk to you because you, for me, come under that heading of someone in the public eye who, when you think about them, you smile. (laughs) Is that because I'm just stupid? Well, there's a a degree of stupidity, (laughs) Tony, but no, it's because I think you, you give off some lovely vibes. Well, I enjoy what I'm doing. You know, I enjoy talking nonsense, which I've done for the last 58 years, <laughs> rather like rather like you do on, uh, you know, your programmes, which I love. Maybe I'm carrying the torch of, of, of talking nonsense that, that you began all those years ago. <laughs> and, and here's the thing. I mean, I thought, well, I know a lot about Tony Blackburn anyway, just by being alive at the time that I've been alive, having an interest in radio and the business and everything. I had no idea until I did some research on you that you began as a singer. Yes. Uh, I was down in uh, Bournemouth, Bournemouth Pavilion. Uh, I was with a 15-piece orchestra. I was a guitarist and singer. I made 29 singles uh, as a singer and two LPs, and none of them sold very well. (laughs) be absolutely honest with you. I had one. I had a, um, the first record I made, was, which was called, well, the second one called So Much Love, which I um, I bought it out, believe it or not, at the same time as opening up Radio 1. And it got in the, it got in the charts very low down. And then the pressing plant went on strike. And so nobody could get, and the singing career never really recovered from that, really. It was one of those things. I would have thought then, or maybe you'd done the odd thing, but how many singles did you say you released? 29 singles. We even released them on a CD. We thought we might be able to sell it by actually just releasing them all on a CD yeah. all together, and that didn't sell either. <laughs> <laughs> but, but enough of that. I want to go right back to the beginning. Uh, because I'm always interested in people who who have a thing from an early age. And, and for you, we've already gone in one odd direction, I would imagine, for a lot of the listeners in talking about singing. But you had a sports yeah. scholarship as, as a kid yes. and you captained the school cricket team. Yes, I did. I went to Millfield and I bowled a ball down at the headmaster. He said, imagine that I'm the stumps. And I bowled it down and hit him quite fast on the leg. He said, "By God, that was fast!" And he gave me a, a sports scholarship on on that. Well, on that based based weird. on that, yes, <laughs> it's odd. <laughs> I wasn't that great at cricket, um, but I, you know, I could bowl a ball down like anybody else. But I did get this sports scholarship because Millfield is the most, or was, and I still think it is the most expensive school in the country. Well, then I think you must be being modest because. You say I wasn't that good, but you, you got in on a blooming scholarship and then you capped in the team. The great dancer, John Sargent, <laughs> from Strictly Come Dancing, he, he was in my team. Was he, really? he was there at the same time, yes, and um, lovely guy. And, uh, yeah, I was also I, in the, the football team, the rugby team and all the rest of it, and I don't really like sport very much, to be absolutely honest with you. Then I went on to college and uh, did a diploma. I've got a diploma in business. All right which I really didn't, I wasn't interested in, but to break into show business uh, and, and you know, the, the radio business and things like that, I mean, it's not easy. And particularly in the 60s, it was the 60s, it, uh, there was only the BBC. And so it was um, practically impossible to get in. So how, di- how did you get, how did you, because you were with Cat Radio Caroline, weren't you? Well, I read an advert in the New Musical Express uh, wanting DJs for Radio Caroline. And I sent a tape off and about four days later, I got a letter back saying, please come up to Caroline House, six Chesterfield Gardens. And um, I did an audition up there for them. And they said, when can you start? And it was on the Friday. And I gave my uh, notice to the band down in Bournemouth. 
and I was on the ship on the Wednesday. You've seen unimaginable changes, haven't you? In, mm. I mean, you really yeah. have. You, you, because I would say, yeah. in my humble opinion, that in the 1970s, when you were on Radio One and Top of the Pops, that was the best time to be doing that. You, you really were hitting the bullseye. Yeah, I mean, I loved, I loved doing the pirate ship. So I'm very proud to have been a part of Radio Caroline and. The station that I really love was a station called Big L Radio London, which was an American station, a big, big uh, pirate ship that came alongside Radio Caroline. And eventually we had Swinging Radio England. We had three pirate boats in a row, strangely enough, off the coast of Frinton, <laughs> when nothing happened. <laughs> it was like an invasion fleet. But I went on Radio <laughs> London and, and um, we, I was actually shipwrecked in Frinton as well. We had a ten. <laughs> we had a ten force gale one night, and um, we we always joked about the fact that we'd end up on the coast of Frinton. But it was a ten force gale, which was quite something. And um, I remember somebody came down. I was doing the breakfast show and said, "You've got to get up because you know it's not looking too good." I think we're and, and it was pitch black at night, and we and, and at night time when you're out in the sea, you can't really tell how far you're away from anything. So. I got up there and I stood by the captain and he shone a searchlight and there were people walking along the seafront <laughs> and he, in a very, and in a very, very small voice, he said, Mayday. <laughs> and we all thought, <laughs> we all thought it's a bit too late for that. <laughs> and um, we were taken off by Breaches Boy, in other words, a rope that came over into the hands of the local police force who said how much they were enjoying the program, gave us a cup of tea and sent us home. No. And you would live. You would live on the boat. You would eat on the boat. Yeah. How often would you? How often would you come off the boat? We did two weeks on the ship and a week off. Right. Uh, that's the way it worked. And I loved every moment of it. I really enjoyed it. And also at the same time, it was there to break the monopoly of the BBC. You know, because there was nothing going on. Yeah. The they don't. They weren't playing music or anything. And it was a different time. So we did break that monopoly eventually, which was great. And then, of course, we joined another monopoly, which was the BBC and Radio 1. And and how did that come to be? You Famously, you were the very first uh, disc jockey on Radio yeah. 1. You played Flowers in the Rain by That's The right. Move. There's a very famous clip of you welcoming everybody to this new, exciting uh, station. Yeah. So hard to imagine now, a time when that was new. How did it come about? Well, um I was on the ships for three years, and uh, I was introduced to a lovely guy called Harold Davison, who was one of the biggest agents going. He handled, in this country, Frank Sinatra and people like that. And I was introduced to him, and we got on like a house on fire, and he said to me, he said, I think the time is for you to come off because radio, the BBC are going to be forced to have a station. And he said, I think I can get you a job on there. And he did the old thing, and this is absolutely true, Rob. He said to me, I'd like to be your manager you sign with me, I could make you the top disc jockey in three months. So I thought about it for about two seconds, and got my pen out and signed. And we became the greatest of friends. He was like a second father to me. And he got me the job, first of all, on the light program, the old light program. And I did a program there called Midday Spin. And then I opened up Radio One. And uh, I love the introduction I got to uh, the BBC there. They were lovely there. They were very old fashioned in a way. And um, they asked me for a script uh, uh, when I got to the light program. Yeah. They said, the producer said, can I, can I have a script, please? And I said, oh, I, said I, I haven't written a script. I don't, I ad lib. And he said, well, what are you going to say? I said, well, I don't know until I say it. And he showed me an Alan Freeman script, which said, not off, A-R-F, uh, pop pickers. And I said, well, he said, OK, then you're going to ad lib. He said, would you mind, though, coming in here an hour before the program Otherwise, I'm going to have to cancel the coffee and donuts. And that was my introduction <laughs> to the BBC. How soon did you become this huge figure in popular culture? I think really, to be honest with you, it was probably about three or four weeks because there was a monopoly. Yes. I mean, we yeah. had the BBC monopoly. I got in, I did the breakfast show. We had 21 million people listening every morning. But it was an amazing time. I mean... It'll never, nobody will ever get that time again, you know, because it was, well, as you say, there weren't the channels. And if you were on BBC or ITV, and if you were on Radio One, 
that was it. But but know? also there, there there was we were a far more deferential society. That's the thing I always think of when I when I see the way the audience members on those top of the pops gaze at you and I don't know Noel Edmonds. How did that make you feel in terms of if you're getting this sort of um, hysteria? at PAs and stuff. Now, if you're a pop star, you can yeah. say, well, yeah, they like my music, they like da-da-da-da. But you're there and you must come away thinking, oh, what are they screaming about? They they like the way I host a show, I introduce records. Was that yeah. at all unsettling? Well, well, no, we were built up like pop stars. I mean, we were... Um, Jackie Magazine was the big pop star to be in and things like that. And uh, so I was built up because I was only 24 years old when I opened up Radio 1. So I was built up as a pop star, and um, and that was it. But it never – it was very important, I think, and, and I had a good grounding with Harold. Mm. And uh, mm. I saw the way one or two DJs and personalities went, and it went to their head. They became very big-headed about it. And um, I was, was quite grounded. You, I mean, you've, you've loved radio, and, and you've worked yes. on many different stations. You continue to work on different stations. Mm-hmm. And, and the real love of your life, of course, musically, is, so, is soul music. Yeah, I love soul music. I mean, I, I got to know Stevie Wonder very well. Oh. He turned up at a, at a show I was doing, which I just launched, a thing called the Radio London Soul Night Out. He came right out of the blue just to say thanks for playing Motown Records. I didn't know he was coming. And we became very friendly. I toured with Dinah Ross and the Supremes. I mean, she was wonderful. And T- Tell um, me I the story. Know. Tell me the story. One of my favorite songs of hers. And again, I didn't realize oh. I, I'm still waiting. Yeah. People will, people yes. will, you know, I'm still waiting. I mean, she, I, she doesn't do it as good as that. But um, re- tell yeah. people your involvement with that song. Well, I was putting together, I've been very lucky. Most of my life I've been able to play records that I want to play. I don't work playlists and things like that. So I do have a deep love of music. And so um, I was putting together a soul show that I did on Radio London. And I listened to an album track of Diana Ross's. And I was sort of, as it were, in between marriages. Um, and I would, I'd been uh, divorced for about 13 or 14 years. And I was actually really lonely. And I was listening to this song called I'm Still Waiting by Diana Ross. And I thought, this is exactly the way I feel at this time. So I rung up Motown and I said, you've got the most wonderful song on an album of Dinah Ross's. If you release it as a single, I'm sure it would do well. And they said, really? And I said, yeah, it's called I'm Still Waiting. And they rung Dinah Ross up in the States. And she said, well, if he thinks it's going to be a hit, release it. The American soul music, like the Drifters and people like that, I've always loved. And when I went to Radio 1, they weren't playing it at the BBC and so I introduced Motown uh, to the BBC in a strange sort of way. And I made sure on my breakfast show I played a lot of soul music. Mm. And um, because I loved it, yeah. for no other reason. Marvin Gaye and people like that, you know. And do, how, how up to date are you with new bands and new music? Are, are you still open to that? Yes. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I keep up to date on all the charts and everything like that. I, mean, I, I love Silk Sonic and um, Alessia Keys and people like that. The Golden Hour, which is a show I do on Radio 2, yeah. we play one new record. And, and I do a, a program on BBC Local Radio, a four-hour show. God, that's a long time, isn't it? <laughs> Four hours. <laughs> um, but I also play a mixture of old music and new music as well. And with the soul music, I like to keep up to date with all the new stuff as well. I think it's really important to do that. You said that Noel Edmonds called you up when he was going to go on to I'm a Celebrity. Now, he, he went yeah. on. Of course, he didn't win. You did win it. You were yeah. crowned King of the Jungle. Uh, when was that? That was 2002. So was it the not. first or the, or the oh, second God. year? I tell you what. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the very hat. That is that's the hat that you general. wore. Was, was this the yeah. first I'm a Celeb or the second I'm a Celeb? It was the first. That was you, were, right. So you were the first one. So... So it yeah. was an it was a, it was not tried and tested then. So w- no. what was your approach when when they came to you? Was it a, a a no brainer or did you have to think about it? Well, um, my manager um, Nick Nick uh, Nick Cannon, who I've had for about twelve well years now, he's a lovely guy, and uh, we um, he said to me, he rang me up one day, and he said, "How would you like to be dropped in the middle of the Australian jungle and survive for a fortnight?" And I said, oh, that sounds like fun. And I thought he was joking. <laughs> and I said, they're not going to want a 60-year-old vegetarian to go in there. <laughs> and then uh, about a couple of weeks later, 
my manager rang up and said, um, they want you to do the program. My wife and my mother at the time, she tried to talk me out of it, uh. said, you won't be very good at that because I'm quite a private person, actually. But I thought to myself, you know, these opportunities happen once in a lifetime. I, and they explained to me this was one of the biggest shows that ITV had ever done. And I thought, and I said to my wife, I said, I would hate it if I looked at this program and I thought I could have been a part of that. So I said, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm going to do it. And uh, so I did it and I didn't expect to win it. And then when I came back, my wife said, I knew you'd do well. <laughs> <laughs> and that was 20 years ago. And you said yeah, you're, are you, you're about to turn 80, yes? Yes, January the 29th. OK, well, I'll, I'll wish you a happy birthday in advance. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure talking to you. Rob, it's been lovely talking to you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you.